plays, he does in arts, in literature, in dance, in the world. Music, film, you know, IAC brings all of that to you. I won't go over it because you've been here all day and you've heard the story all day long. You might think I'm wearing this to honor Dr. Lee's exceptional work. His work is exceptional, right about that. But I'm wearing this because I'm going to be watching Marty right now. This, this is bad. So, you know, Dr. T also needs no introduction. Uh, he is Florence and Robert Irving. I do need to read their names. Curator of Arts of South and Southeast Asia at the Metropolitan Museum of New York. He has, he's an elected fellow of so many organizations. But, you know, he spent 24 years at Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, preparing for his role at the Met. He is uh, well known by all uh, in, in this field. Anybody who is in the art field knows him. And one of the things he's done, his latest project, and I won't go through everything he's written because he's written quite a bit and you can move it. But one of the things he's done that is truly remarkable is his latest project, which is the tree and serpent, devoted to the exploration of the early Buddhist art in the Deccan. All of us who grew up in India assume that somehow uh, Buddhism flew from North India to Sri Lanka and really with no on wings, yeah. but actually that is not the case. There are some magnificent pieces of sculpture and seen for the very first time. So not only is he a detective in the art of wings, the Buddhist art with the, the Hellenized world and the Roman world and South and Southeast Asia, but he's also a detective. To get those works, magnificent sculptures from India, from the different museums, takes diplomacy of a very high order. So thank you so much for coming to this video. And let me just give you quotes from two people. One from Dalrymple. One of the most striking shows the Met has put on in a long time. And this is from Colin Cotton, who said, New York Times. We haven't seen such a display of ancient art from India. On this scale, in years, and are unlikely to see it for some time. So you have to get this book. This is a magnificent book, which has all of these sculptures in it. You can get it from Amazon. You can get it from the Republic. There's also a Maple Indian edition. This is just a magnificent book. I cannot recommend it more. And it's just the kind of work that you want to see done. It's a, it's a very unique work. And he will engage Dr. E will, Dr. Guy, sorry, he's not a French version. He will engage in a conversation with Joshin. Joshin Oroy is the vice president in charge of tax salary on 57th Street. This is on 57th Street. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a magnificent place if you haven't been there, and I expect 90% of you have been there already. It's just a marvelous gallery with you know wonderful collections of artwork, including some of your uh, your group that you have a particular affinity for, Modern which is women artists, right. artists, women artists. Right. Right. So if you haven't been there, I urge you to go. And meanwhile, you have a little treat. So she, Dr. D.
John is going to do a short presentation on the book, um, after which we'll engage um, in, in a Q&A and then open it up to the audience. So I'm going to hand it over to you, John. Thank you, Jesse. And, and welcome, everyone. What I want to do in this relatively short time we have is, is talk a little bit about the exhibition. I probably should do a straw poll and ask those who've seen the exhibition to raise their hands. Um, this is, this is gratifying indeed, thank you. Um, the bad news is it closed last Sunday, having had a four-month run, um, but is having a second iteration at the National Museum of Korea in Seoul. Uh, we'll be there for another four months before returning to Delhi, uh, and then dispersed uh, to the various lenders. Um, I should perhaps begin by... <clears throat> I have rather a substantial PowerPoint, and I think that may be a little bit too ambitious for the... For the the time frame we have. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, what the exhibition is and, and, and is not in the publication. Um, the exhibition itself uh, uh, it was not concerned, it, it, there was no a special desire to do an exhibition of standard Buddhist images, the A to Z of Buddhism, uh, which has been done many times, even uh, in the Indian context, beginning in Matara, taking a little side trip up to Peshawar Valley in Pakistan, to Sarnath, to South Bihar, and so on. Um, for, the, for the familiar territory of the greater Magadha uh, region where the Buddha uh, lived and taught. Uh, uh, that, that territory is uh, foundational to the study of early Buddhist art. Uh, it's also a very well-trodden path. And what we wanted to do at the Met was to add, add, uh, add to the narrative, to expand uh, people's understanding of the origins of Buddhist art. What I, my, my vision was to create an exhibition which would make sense of the religious landscape um, of, of which existed uh, in the fifth century, when, when, when a young prince was born in, in Kapilavastu, the, the Sapya clan's uh, capital, in uh, northern, uh, what's today northern UP, bordering on western uh, Nepal. Uh, what was that religious landscape? We just heard from the previous speaker uh, very erudite presentations on the, the profound uh, and ancient uh, the Vedic uh, traditions of India, of course, uh, which, which are so foundational uh, for modern day uh, uh, Hinduism. Um, but I should uh, also raise the, the issue that when this young prince made this seismic decision to leave uh, the palace, to leave his position and, and inheritance, his a wife and a newborn son, um, uh, depart the palace at night, go into the woods, uh, perform the tonsor, uh, discard his, well, his, his clothes for soiled rags, and become a wandering mendicant, a wisdom seeker. Uh, what did he f discover on day two when he woke up in the forest? And of course, he, he didn't meet many Brahmins, I think, you know, chanting Vedas or necessarily. What he would have meant, met were, were shrines dedicated to nature spirits to the Yakshas, uh, the Nagas, the Yakshis, the Naginis. These were the living landscape of early India. And as any, many of you, all of you will know, um, have never departed India. They're still a part of that living landscape today. And so I, I was very conscious when we look at early Buddhist art, and we begin the story with a wonderful second century realized Buddha from Mathura or a third century standing Buddha from Amaravati. Um, that's presented as if that's the beginning of the narrative. Um, and it, it struck me that there were 400 years that precede that in which the Buddha is not represented um, iconically at all. There is no icon, no image of the Buddha uh, really until the second century in the north, early third century in the, in the, in the south. Um, and if the conventional wisdom now is the Buddha probably died around the year 400 BCE. So between 400 BCE and around 200 Common Era, it's a very long stretch of time in terms of the foundations of Buddhism. And the Buddha is completely absent in human form uh, for all those centuries. Um, he's there, of course, but he's there in, in an iconic form, in, 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 in signs and symbols, auspicious marks, ways in which uh, his presence is evoked. Um, and so much of the exhibition was devoted precisely to that and in, uh, examine this in the book, uh, tease out these ideas to uh, get an understanding of the, the foundations of Buddhism um, and the way in which the Buddha, as a wisdom seeker, had to navigate that religious landscape um, and accommodate um, uh, the, the, these very powerful local, uh, local deities, the, the nature spirit cults, 
uh, and their power is uh, self-evident when you look at the early Buddhist art. Um, when we talk of early Buddhist art, of course, what we mean is the art of adornment of the stupa. This is the principal uh, uh, monument, the funerary mound to house the relics, uh, central to Buddhist devotion. And the adornment of the stupa, which evolved over time. When, when, the, when the eight rulers of Magadha you know, all stormed up to Kapitavastu and demanded their share of the relics and took them back uh, hastily on, on, on the backs of elephants to their kingdoms and, uh, and, and interred them in a, in a, in a, in a, in a stupa, it's probably part of earth, a mound of earth, a tumuli. Um, over time, these were rebuilt, solid core brick structures, um, and in, in due course, embellished with sculptural decoration. So that whole process would have happened over several centuries. Um, and uh, it's what, what is re re remarkable is that the way in which um, um, that they, the way in which the relics of the Buddha were in turn um, distributed, uh, particularly through the interventions of, of Emperor Ashoka in the mid third century, uh, widely across the uh, the Mughalian kingdom, and this was a key uh, moment in terms of, of, of spreading the teachings of Buddhism and uh, propagating uh, the, the faith and so on. So let me just take you through a, a, a few images to, begin, to give you a sense of what the exhibition uh, looked like um, and uh, the, the arguments that are contained in, in the book itself. So the territory we're talking about is essentially known to all of you and extends from the from the, the Konkan coast on, on the west, the Arabian Sea, right through to the Bay of Bengal. This is a territory that the Satavahanas uh, came to control over a number of centuries. They didn't control it all at one time, uh, but uh, they expanded their, their power. Um, and um, at their peak, around the second century common era, uh, had, had all these traits of, of, of land under their command. Both of this central region is, of course, dominated by the river systems, uh, the Tapi and others which flow west, and the Godavari and the Krishna that flow east. Um, and these provide, of course, networks and trade systems, of course, as well. So this landscape that the Buddha encountered was essentially one uh, represented by these shrines. Uh, we have the great uh, images, monumental images of Yakshas uh, and Yakshis uh, as freestanding figures uh, which would have been venerated in uh, open shrines, almost certainly. Um, uh, no, no structural uh, monuments at this point. Um, and uh, the figure on the right from, from, from uh, uh, Nagar from Vidisha Museum, uh, almost certainly the figure of uh, Mani Bhadra, uh, uh, worshipped by merchants uh, as the personification of wealth. Uh, his, and his companion, of course, was Kabera, who has prevailed down into to modern times. But Mani Bhadra was, was there at the very beginning and named in a number of inscriptions. So when we first see the Buddha presence being e evoked uh, in the decoration of, of, of these stupa railings and so on, this is a section two posts from the Vedika in which would create the uh, enclosure uh, pathway, the production of Pata, the circumambulation passage, uh, and the Buddha's presence is clearly indicated. Uh, you have um, the uh, empty throne represented here by this uh, very simple rectangle evoking the the, 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 the throne upon which the, Buddha, uh, the Buddha's site of meditation is marked, the Vajra Asana in Bodhgaya, and in this instance also by the Buddha Pada, uh, the, with the Dhamma Chakra decoration. Uh, the one on the right uh, also invokes, invokes the story of uh, the Nagamukha Linda, who rescued the Buddha during a great storm. Many of you know the story, um, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's confirmed by a Brahmi inscription here, which actually names the snake as Mukalinda, the and on the uh, on the on the the, the right uh, uh, the donor inscription uh, from a, 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 a female monastic from, from a nun. The Satavahanas were very enterprising uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, I contest in the book that uh, their significance uh, in terms of the early economy of, of Moyan. Uh, uh, India, uh, uh, moving into the early common era, uh, was probably arguably more, more, more important than that of the Kushanas. Uh, the Kushanas, we always think of dominating uh, northern India and the connections into Central Asia, which is, of course is true. But uh, the great wealth that flowed into the Deccan, primarily triggered by the control of maritime trade on the two coasts, 
on the west coast and on the Bay of Bengal. Um, the, the particularly, um, this trade goes back very early, of course, to uh, the contacts with uh, Archimedes Iran in the 5th and 4th centuries at the, the peak of the Moyun period, and then it continues, of course, into the common era uh, with this new boom of trade taking place with the, between uh, the Satavahanas uh, and Imperial Rome, the first third century uh, Mediterranean world. And that trade became enormously important. And there are lots of little archaeological bits and pieces, coins, clay ceilings and so on, uh, which give you a sense of, of the importance of those ships being represented on Satavahana coins, an important uh, you know, indicator. The earliest stupas themselves um, uh, almost certainly were very modest structures. Uh, stupa, uh, the Sanskrit from tupa, the Pali, really essentially only refers to a mound, a mound of earth. Uh, but then uh, decorated in, in elaborate ways. One of the finest uh, in the south that still survives is, is Chandavaram, represented on the screen here, and uh, uh, above uh, one of the very earliest depictions in which we see uh, representation of what looks like three uh, production apatas, three, three pathways for circumambulating uh, the stupa. And what, what you're doing is you're, uh, you're putting yourself in, in, in close proximity to the relics. Uh, which are uh, understood to be housed within. Sanchi too is one of the best preserved uh, uh, railings that survived. The stupa has been heavily restored. And uh, all of these um, stupas contained uh, significant deposits of relics. And we were able in the exhibition, we were very privileged uh, in many ways with this exhibition, but we secured um, original relics, from, uh, relic containers from the Sanchi area. Uh, and we also had original relic offerings, um, uh, which have the status of contact relics um, from Pipraha, a site in northern UP. And the Pipraha relics, uh, 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 we'll come to later, but simply to mention, they were found in association with bone matter and an inscription stating that they were the corporeal remains of the Buddha. Now, this site is 10 or 12 miles south of Lumbini. Okay, so it's extremely close proximity to, to the place of the Buddha's birth, which was confirmed in uh, 1897 uh, by inscriptions that were discovered by the Nepalese. Um, and then in 1898, uh, an estate manager at Pipraha excavated a mound, uh, um, assumed to be a stupa, it proved to be the case, um, and produced the, the most important relic discovery of, of the century. Um, um, and this was a moment when uh, archaeology in India, this Buddhist archaeology was very, what I call, call, what I call it stupa archaeology. It was really, there was some preoccupied with, with, with uh, uh, the stupas not looking at the wider uh, devotional landscape. Uh, stupas, of course, are central to any monastic complex, but they're not the whole story. There are the assembly halls, the preaching halls, the image houses, and of course the monastic uh, quarters for living, or for everyday life. Uh, all of that. Uh, so uh, the discovery of, of these relics has really was uh, very, very significant. Um, I show you from, uh, the fact that many sites will have multiple relics, not just the one in the heart of the in the stupa. So Amaravati, for example, on the left of the screen, uh, they found I think over 10, 10 or 12 relic containers um, uh, from different locations, both within the core and then within the Ayaka platforms, the four projecting platforms, um, uh, which were added uh, very much a southern feature. Um, Sopara, it's more or less suburban Mumbai these days, I guess. Um, a very important port city in the, the Konkan coast, um, uh, the site where uh, the famous uh, sandalwood trader Purna, um, who celebrated in the Purna Avadana stories, uh, where he operated uh, and trained, became a connoisseur of sandalwood, made a fortune and converted his wealth into, into Buddhist merit by gifting all of his wealth uh, to, the, to uh, the monastery in Sopara. Um, that, uh, that was excavated in the 1890s uh, uh, and uh, these are the relics, sorry, the relics that were found. Uh, now I, I understand in the um, uh, Asiatic Society in Mumbai. The Sanchi uh, reliquies here, um, 
and displaying of relics. And we, we featured this in the exhibition, in which we had uh, some extraordinary panels from uh, the, 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 the uh, Andhra Pradesh, from Dupadu, uh, in which we see the relics fully on display. You see the detail here. Um, Samji, of course, is the most famous preserved site, but there were many, many others. And we tried to feature in, in the uh, publication um, the two of the m most important recent discoveries in Buddhist archaeology in India. One, one is the site of Panagiri, uh, close by to Hyderabad, two-hour drive, excellent road. Um, and the other is Kandalahali in northern Karnataka. Uh, and both of these have, have, have really transformed um, our understanding of, of, of the stylistic range that existed in uh, uh, early Buddhist art. Just a glimpse of the exhibition itself. This is the way we installed the relics, uh, created the walkway, so the visitor, in order to see the relic offerings, was obliged to do the circumambulation, so they have that experience. We have a Sangha here in uh, New York, a branch of a, a Sri Lankan monastery, um, and uh, they're stationed out in Queens, very conveniently, and we asked the monks to bless the exhibition, and also uh, for permission to record the chanting of sutras. So as you entered this space, uh, you would hear the chanting of, of the word of the Buddha um, as preserved in the Pali tradition of Sri Lanka, which is as close as we'll ever get to the lost Buddhist tradition of Andhra Desa, of ancient Andhra. So we, got, we came close, uh, so to speak. Um, the Pipraha relics, um, uh, I used to say my gallery exhibition tours, uh, Tiffany window display. Um, these are mini, tiny little pieces of, of beautifully worked gemstones, pearls, uh, uh, shell, um, uh, rock crystal and so on. Um, each of those items were gifted by an individual seeking merit uh, for themselves and for their family. Um, this deposit uh, had not been disturbed, Arche the archaeology tells us this, had not been disturbed since around 200 BCE. So these, these are very close. Uh, we're talking 200 years after the Buddha's passing. This is historical terms. It's not very long ago. Ashoka was there, but we a generation earlier uh, at, this, at this site. Um, so this is a, sort of material we're able to bring together um, and um, to show you the, the uh, reconstruction, we, uh, a model and, uh, as well of, of, of a stupa. Uh, and the site itself is uh, preserved today. The ASI have excavated, uh, did an excellent job in the 1970s, excavating the monastic complex associated with the, with the original stupa. And on the right are the original plan drawings prepared by the excavator in 1898. Uh, and um, just some of the, 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 the site during excavation, it's, uh, 19th century archaeology was a little bit brutal. So when you go to investigate a stupa, you put a, a trench straight through. And that's what you see here, okay? Um, and go to the core, and yet when you're at ground level, uh, within the core, but ground level outside, that's where you generally find the relics. Um, and uh, sure enough, there they were, still embedded in original uh, Moyan flat bricks, large, flat, thin uh, bricks, very distinctive. Um, hadn't been rebuilt in you know post uh, Mayan times, uh, so I think I'll, I'll st stop here um, and we'll d discuss a little bit more um, and uh, then take questions. I'm very conscious of time. I could go on for an hour, but <laughs> some time, the time won't permit. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for the overview of the of the exhibition. Um, I have to say, I did, you know, I did see the exhibition a few few weeks back, and it was um, the most incredible experience. Um, I think even as somebody with an art history background, there was much to discover. Um, so thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunate timing. It closed last weekend, um, but I think what we do have in place of that is that incredible book. Um, I have been devouring it, <laughs> reading through it um, in the last few weeks, um, and I think what I'd really love to delve into to begin with is the question of scholarship. Um, 
you know, often I think scholarship can, can lead to exhibitions, um, but I think what really struck me was, it seemed to me that there was a gap in terms of scholarship in, in sort of Buddhist, early Buddhist art in, in southern India. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that, like is that something you encountered? Um, and what sort of led your interest to that area? Certainly, yes. It was, those of us who have taken an interest in early, early Buddhism in India, um, I think there was a growing awareness that, that uh, the Satavahanas were really being treated as a footnote to the Kushanas. Um, and, um, the art which resulted from their, the, the, produced under their reign, um, was, was generally uh, pretty marginalized. Um, and um, so it's not to deny the importance of the north. Of course, the, the whole greater Magadha region, the Gangetic Valley region, uh, is, is absolutely uh, central. Uh, these are the territories in which the Buddha uh, traversed in his lifetime, of course. Um, he didn't venture south, um, but it's quite clear that relatively quickly after his passing, his relics did. His corporeal remains did travel um, and were distributed widely and stupas were built in Dakshinapata in those regions to the south, um, uh, spreading, his, <coughs> spreading his teachings. So when I was conceptualizing the exhibition, I very much wanted to, to bring the foreground uh, a whole range of, 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 of Buddhist art that's uh, essentially not on people's radars uh, to, to a large degree. There's material sitting in smaller museums in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, uh, the two principal regions, uh, but elsewhere, as Maharashtra and other places as well, um, and to, to, to uh, present a different narrative, uh, present one which celebrates uh, uh, the Satavahanas and the Svakus, uh, and to uh, spanning from the first BC to around the uh, fourth century, um, and, uh, and, and the, the Buddha, the, some of the unique Buddhist art they produced. Um, did you, do, stylistically, do you find sort of differences, or what are, I'm sure they are, what are the differences between um, sort of the visual culture and stylistic differences in the um, narratives that you found in, in this region, especially since I know some of the sculptures are being shown for the first time. Uh, between that and the Maghad region, um, could you kind of elaborate on that? Sure, yes, uh, very much. There's an almost stylistic range, of course. The iconography is pretty standard. Um, and um, one room we devoted entirely to the aniconic representations, um, in which the, and we, the, this is discussed in, in, in some, some detail in the book, um, at the ways in which the Buddha is represented in these uh, uh, symbolic ways, uh, with the, the, the Buddha Pada, uh, with the riderless horse for the great departure, the, uh, the, the, the wheel for the teachings, and, and so on. Um, uh, the way they're, the stylistically, the way they're represented, uh, uh, there is a lot, and there's a range of factors to do with that, um, which I won't go into in detail here. There's partly also materials that in the south, uh, they work predominantly in limestone, as opposed to the northern uh, sandstone, um, widely available, um, and um, that, that produces a different aesthetic as well. Um, but I think in terms of the stylistic origin, you can point to the, the single most important uh, monument uh, is probably Bahut. Uh, dated to around 150 BCE. Many of you have been to the Indian Museum in Kolkata, and they have uh, a very large room in which the enclosure, uh, the surviving elements of the enclosure railing are, are beautifully installed. Uh, uh, that material was moved in the 1880s from Bahu, on bullet carts, uh, to Kolkata and installed uh, in the late 19th century and an extraordinary uh, monument. Style evident in that uh, is becomes a pan-Indian style in the south, uh, and other styles grow out of that, particularly Kandalahali, which is, a, as I say, is a, a news site near Gulbarga, um, and um, uh, also the, the later material, Panagiri. Um, are these sites um, open to visitors, just out of curiosity, because I know that you, you've sort of recent excavations of these sites from where these relics have been found in the stupas. Are these something, are they, are they sort of in a preserved form that will be accessible to visitors? And the exhibition was probably the, the, the best way to access much of this material in, in, in truth. Yeah. Um, the the Panagiri uh, site uh, you can visit freely. Uh, the material, the sculptural material from the site has been removed uh, for security um, and is in a, in a, in a go-down facility. Uh, so that, that is not immediately accessible. 
uh, Kandal Hali, uh, which uh, is the greatest Sanati area, but if you're familiar with that, and Gulbarga uh, is under ASI administration, that uh, they did an extensive excavation, uh, an excellent publication, um, and um, that is, it's been well documented and well recorded, um, um, but, it's, but it's not yet accessible to a wider public. You actually need a letter from the DG of archaeology in Delhi, of course, uh, and then you present yourself in Karnataka with your um, with your letter, and you have access. Uh, so it's, um, uh, it's it's rather rather limited. So the exhibition provided a rare opportunity uh, to see much of this. It was, and I, you know, I was speaking to John earlier, and he told me that they had two hundred and twenty thousand. Am I right? Visitors to the exhibition over the period of its opening. So I think that deserves a round of applause. I mean, um, I think especially, and I think coming back to sort of uh, circling back to my first question, I do feel um, I see this opening up the field of um, research and scholarship tremendously for this. And so when you were commissioning essays, because um, you know the book has about, I think, 10 or 11 contributors. And I think what's incredible about the book is that you know there are sort of general essays uh, with overviews that's very accessible to, to anyone walking in that does not have sort of a background of familiarity. Uh, but, and then there's, there's also very specific uh, specificities of, of this period and of the exhibition and of the objects. Um, and I think that, that's a very special about the book. So I do, I do hope you all have a look at it. Uh, so circling back to that, what was that sort of um, how did you approach the commissioning of these essays? Okay, well, the, 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 yes, so the book is both a collection of essays and uh, uh, the catalogue entries. Right. Um, and uh, I was very concerned, I think we're at a point in art history terms, it's probably true of many disciplines, um, that uh, you cannot really get, dig into a subject with sufficient depth from one perspective alone. And so I was very conscious of, of inviting uh, the need to invite uh, people who, who are doing specialist work in, in related areas. Um, and um, so we, I have to say that the field of early Buddhist studies in southern India is rather small. Uh, it's a small niche area of, of scholarship um, and we were able to get um, actually almost everybody who's involved in this field uh, to contribute uh, short, short, es short essays. Um, and uh, so this sort of adds, adds value, I think, and we produce our publications um, very much with a student readership in mind, uh, that these will become standard textbooks for, for teaching and for dissemination. Uh, we um, ensured that this publication was simultaneously uh, released in India with an Indian publisher, uh, and has had wide coverage in, in the Indian media the last few months. Um, and it's that's a popular Diwali gift. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, so. Apparently, yeah. it's been a popular Diwali gift in India um, amongst, amongst families yes, so and that, 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 that was wonderful news. Uh, so, uh, it's reaching a lot of people, uh, in short, um, and uh, that, that, that's essentially our mission as a museum. Um, and um, I think the ways in which we can shift the narrative, I think, the, um, I was able, we then had a two-day symposium, 300 plus both days, attending that, um, and um, plus live streaming, um, and that was a, a way in which we could bring in additional voices, um, uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, five speakers uh, from India, and some from Europe and elsewhere. Um, a very, very productive dialogue uh, took place there. So um, the ways in which like, we can push the field um, uh, is Institutions like the Met uh, have capacity and therefore have responsibility uh, to uh, contribute in ways that really expand our understanding of the past. Um, and uh, so doing safe exhibitions is not really what we should be doing. We should be taking risks um, and we should be pushing into areas of scholarship which have not really been opened up to any substantial way before. And the exhibition definitely achieves that, and, and the book more so. Um, you know, if you just sort of walk into the exhibition, um, and I know you, you've touched upon that, that's the central premise of the exhibition um, is um, the, the absence of the Buddha. So I think when you walk, to, walk through the exhibition, it was only in the last sort of exit room, so to speak, that you really see the iconic uh, Buddha figure. So in terms of the iconography, um, 
I know it's coming back to the basics, but why the tree and the serpents? Okay, well, <clears throat> the, the, the title tree and serpent really um, crystallized in my mind uh, as, as uh, the selection of the exhibition uh, uh, moved along. And uh, it was very clear that if there are two uh, ubiquitous motifs that, that prevail in southern Buddhist imagery, it is that of the Naga protecting the relics, but protecting the Buddha in his lifetime, uh, uh, self-appointed guardians of the relics after his passing. You see them entwined, um, almost affectionately wrapped, knotted around the drum and the dome of the stupa itself, um, and the uh, stories relating to all of that. Um, and of course, the, 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 the tree, uh, uh, which in the first instance, of course, is the Bodhi tree, the, the wisdom tree of the, the marking the enlightenment uh, moment. Uh, but it's more than that. It's also the wish-fulfilling tree. It's the ancient uh, pre-Buddhist concept of the tree shrine, uh, uh, which would permeate the Indian landscape. And we have this an extraordinary image, again, Indian Museum, Calcutta, uh, entrance, entrance hall. They have the great wish-fulfilling uh, two meter high monolithic stone uh, from the, the Vidisha region, um, uh, extraordinary object um, in which uh, this great garmented tree is represented uh, three dimensionally and around the roots of the tree are uh, pots of money, sacks of money, conscious disgorging coins and so on. It's uh, all about, uh, the, uh, about boon giving if you like um, and uh, uh, no different to the trees you see in any uh, town you walk through uh, today, or the grounds of a temple uh, in which you'll see a tree with puja paper, powders around the base, ribbons tied to the trunk, uh, offerings being made. Uh, this is a continuum uh, which uh, is, is unbroken. I think that was uh, so wonderful. Is there, um, well, I think because you know, early Buddhist art is, is, is storytelling, you know, that is sort of the central. Um, I think it's not only how it was spread, but it's also the central premise of, of the early religion. Um, so I think to see that represented in the exhibition and in the book, because I think like John said, it's a beautifully illustrated book as well, um, was, um, I think it's one of the first times I've seen an exhibition so, so uh, representing it so completely. Um, does the iconic Buddha, like at what point does that actually appear? Does it appear in, in, in this region? Um, is there a particular timeline? Um, well, yes, so the, the Buddha um, appears in human form in the south around, around, around 300, common era, uh, give or take. Um, and uh, we get him in like Junakonda, uh, late phase uh, 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 Pandagiri and, uh, and other sites. Uh, Nagarjunakonda is the most famous site. And there were wonderful panels on loan from, from the Psych Museum uh, in, in the exhibition or discussed in the book. Um, and um, it happens a little earlier in the north, uh, somewhere in the, in the 150, 200, that sort of window, as best we can tell. Um, and, um, but it's, a, it's a, a, a marvelous sort of moment when the Buddha is fully, fully revealed and, and, and then the underlying shifts, the shift of ideas that are taking place that underpin this, um, uh, we, we don't to this day really fully understand why the Buddha was not represented in human form earlier. Uh, the, the sculptural the skills are all there, of course, from the very beginnings. Um, uh, but, but there were clearly theological reasons that made this uh, inappropriate. Uh, and then at, at some point, that thinking shifted. Um, and um, that is not discussed in any of the texts. There's no explanation offered as to why that is the case. Um, we can speculate. Um, I have my theory, and others do as well. Um, and, uh, but essentially, as I suspect, it's to do with the rise of popular Hinduism uh, with, uh, and the essential uh, bhakti element of, of devotionalism, of Hinduism, which are very appealing, very powerful. Um, and um, uh, I think the Buddhists found themselves um, in a defensive posture. I think they were losing support. Because uh, uh, Buddhism only survives, only exists by virtue of the support of the community around them. The, bread, the, the, the food they eat, uh, the structures, of course, funded by the merchant and guild, craft guild uh, communities, uh, very, pro very prosperous uh, under the Satavahanas. Uh, that, that was the wealth um, which funded these, these monumental, spectacular monumental structures. I mean, the biggest architectural monuments 
on the ancient Indian landscape. There was nothing comparable to a, a stupa of the first century BCE, nothing. Um, we don't see substantial Brahmanical temples uh, for another three or four hundred years at least. Uh, it is major, it's a major moment. Thank you. Um, I mean, I do want to leave some time for audience questions. Um, just one last quick question would be, what's the timeline then for the exhibition? I mean, I, an institutional show, I mean, I, I read you started your research in 2014. So timeline to develop it. To develop it, um, just it okay, knows well. <laughs> research, um, okay. you know, it's, it's a monumental task. Sure, so yeah. It's, These exhibitions always have a long gestation period. Um, you can say it's, you know, takes a lifetime, that's glib, but um, the field work for this began about 10 years ago in terms of spending time in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the regions, uh, just being on the road for weeks on end, going to all the sites, visiting the, the storage facilities where one could, um, and then you're building up a, an understanding of the corpus, uh, from that you can distill the selection, then you begin the business of of, of knocking on people's doors and saying, we'd like to borrow something, please. Um, uh, and, um, you know, building, a, building the bridges uh, from that point when uh, they say absolutely not <laughs> to the point where uh, uh, you secure agreement. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's, that takes several years. Truly, like Ram said, you, you are a diplomat as much as a curator. So um, it's very true. Um, I open it up to the audience. I see a, a lot of hands up. So should we start with the uh, I have a question. Uh, you talked about uh, representation of form. Now we know in Hinduism, when you go back to Ashtar Kari or Mahabharata of Patanjali, which is 150 BCE, that uh, Hindu gods were already represented, both Uksal Muthis, Muthis that could be carried, or Muthis which were worshipped in temples. So there is a big gap then. 500 BC, 400 BC, a finally, and 300 CE that you have mentioned. So that is one question. The other point about uh, serpent representation. We do know Patanjali, who in the Indian tradition is supposed to be both of the Yoga and Maharashtra and Ayurveda, is represented with the lower bar as a snake. And, and, the, and Patanjali was from Kashmir. And the cult of the Naga is very important in Krishna, is the bedrock on which the Naga religion is uh, done. And in fact, as one growing up here, I was, you know, I know it firsthand. And, uh, and so, how do, you, how do you find these interconnections? And because that, as a research thing, interconnection between one aspect and the other. Uh, and we see that in Kashmir, for example, the Kashmiri arts being evolved into Western Himalayan, you know, after Kashmir became Islamicized, into both Buddhist kind and the Hindu kind, in Nepal and in Kangra and so on. So perhaps there is a possibility if one explore further, even here, to bring in connections with other art prior to this. Yes, Let me point two, 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 two points just to, to respond to that. Um, when Queen Maya uh, gave birth to the Buddha in the Lumbini Gardens, um, standing, we're told, clutching the branches of the tree, which is flowering, um, her first act was then to go to the family shrine, uh, Kapilavastu, and present the newborn infant to the family deity, who was a yaksha. And, and there are sculptural representations in which the yaksha is emerging from the trunk of the tree in human form and re returning the compliment into the incarnate Buddha to be. Um, so uh, this is the Buddha's own family. Um, so the, the, the centrality of, of, of yaksha cults, the nagas, uh, are there almost in, ever present from, from the very beginnings, from the Mukalinda story. Uh, uh, to the, the protection of the relics, so the Ramagrama stupa, the eighth portion that were washed into the river and guarded by the Nagas, according to one version. Uh, there are multiple versions. Um, uh, so the, the Nagas play a central role as, as, the, as the protectors of the Buddha. Um, and clearly they were very, very powerful. And 
the, the Buddha himself had to accommodate them in, in some way and, um, and uh, work around them. Um, and the, did the Buddha really celebrate, want to celebrate the Naga cults? I don't think so. But he had to accommodate them. And, and this was done in, in, in various ways. So you get the, you know, the, you get the yakshas guarding the four cardinal directions uh, of the stupa, the stupa plan at Kandalahalli. We have it precisely that in little shrines. Um, and you have the have the nagas uh, in, you know, wrapping their bodies around the the, 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 stu the stupas uh, in the in the south, um, and um, it, it's absolutely pervasive. Um, and um, you only have to look at things like um, the role of the nagas in controlling the the rains, power, their power over the of the monsoon, and uh, what did the the Buddhists in the south uh, do? They started developing the dharanis and the charms and the spells that were instrumental so that monks could control the rain. They were trying to appropriate the role of the nagas. Um, and this, of course, would give them enormous power with the local communities, uh, who were essentially agrarian um, and dependent on the rains. Um, and uh, so this, uh, this, this imagery becomes very, very uh, pervasive. You have the, the image of the you know, Gajya Lakshmi, of course. And Gajya Lakshmi is there from the very, very beginning. She's a Dudagiri in Arissa, she's in the Western Gap, rock cut caves, uh, she's at Kasambi, uh, she's, she's there at the beginning of the archaeological record. And you know, Gajya Lakshmi is the best metaphor you could possibly think of for the monsoon, being lustrated by the elephants. Thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, only in doctrinal terms, uh, whether uh, Iconizing, iconizing the Buddha in the link to the rise of the Mahayana sort of sect of Buddhism. That was and, actually. Uh, and that is perhaps uh, later on the same thing develops in the Theravada, but certainly Mahayana actually is the one sect where this particular, kind of, uh, let's say, it became the driver for this kind of uh, fantastic iconography. Uh, just to add on to that, I, I was going to say that in. You, you can speak up. Oh, no, I think mean, I mean, this is um, repeating the question. Oh, there's no mic here. a question. So, just to repeat the question, okay. said that it can. So, my question actually is this as to whether uh, iconizing the Buddha can be linked to the rise of the Mahayana sect. And, and, and that the entire theory, of, I mean, entire practice of development, which uh, the uh, can be the as, as distinct mm -hmm. from the Theravada, but Theravada also adopted. Yeah. That That's a very good question and a very difficult one. The, the, the whole uh, way in which uh, Mahayana emerges uh, and Nagarjuna Konda takes the name of Nagarjuna, uh, one of the primary authors of early Mahayana texts, uh, and there are others, uh, uh, much of the uh, beginnings of, of, of Mahayana in terms of, uh, of, of, of sutras uh, were written in the south. Uh, so, uh, and then disseminated to Kashmir, to, to the northwest, and so on, rewritten in Gandhari and other languages, other proprets. So, it's uh, really a, a, a a major challenge. Uh, uh, textual specialists are working on this very question, um, and um, uh, we have images uh, in races of iconographic problems. So images like uh, you see in the book of uh, standing male figures, rather Mahapurusha type, you know, rather martial, legs apart, arm on arm akimbo, and holding up a lotus not very martial, um, um, and clearly making an offering to the Buddha. Uh, Catalogued as Padmapani, the Bodhisattva Padmapani. But I think too early. I think too early. I think these are actually uh, vener uh, yakshas venerating the Buddha. Uh, but they, did they provide the prototype for the Bodhisattva images a little later? I think yes. I think they do. I think this is, this is the evolution that we're trying to un un unpack and understand better. Thank you for that question. Do you ask me a question? Uh, question? It kind of like uh, similar to what he said. I was just going to say that the Buddha himself said it is not to be worshipped as a god. 
that he was a teacher and a guide, and he did not want to English. So even now, um, my, my in-laws are Sri Lankan, and uh, very practicing Buddhists. But you know, in the hospitals there, they have a picture of the Buddha. And generally, a lot of my order of family members have passed. It's been my experience that as they end and come close to the end, they will forgive me to do that picture. Because the Buddha has taught us not to have any attachments to any worldly goods, including pictures of them. So that might be, I mean, the fact that Buddha himself was saying, I'm not to be worshipped probably is one of the reasons that you have. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure that you're very close to the truth there. Um, I think that the, uh, the Buddha himself, you know, said, I, 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 am my, I, am, I am only my teachings, it's you know, just the Dharma. Um, you know, um, so relics, the person of the Buddha and Dharma, uh, all interchangeable, uh, essentially. One, one is just a, another facet of the same cut stone and um, uh, seen as a unity. Um, but, but, you know, some of the canonical texts also say that the Buddha requested um, in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, he talks about the need, uh, anticipating his own death, uh, that he should be buried in the manner of a Chakravatam. Um, so a spiritual king rather than a, 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 you know, a temporal one, but nonetheless, uh, uh, hence, uh, buried in a, in a funerary mound appropriate to, to kings and people of high status, uh, in the beginnings of the stupa cult. Uh, so um, there's a little bit of ambiguity there uh, in, in, the, in the sources. But um, and a lot of the problem is trying to read back into those original sources, uh, both the, the, the Jatikas, Avadanas, but also the, the uh, paleographic, the biographical sources, uh, uh, which talk about the life of the Buddha, um, and of course, they were, they're written centuries later, and so uh, they're clearly um, uh, um, massaged to, 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 to uh, appropriate to the message they want to convey. Um, but um, I mean, one of the biggest challenges I think Buddhism faced is that uh, it is rather cerebral. I mean, it really goes on in your head. Um, and um, so the absence of images, I think at some point, probably became very challenging in terms of popular, uh, popular support. Uh, and um, uh, uh, hence, I think we see the emergence of the Buddha image alongside the beginnings of Vasudeva, early, early Krishna, and, uh, and uh, Shiva Linga, and so on. 